a honor for me to be not physically, but at least virtually here in India again. And I'm happy to see you all again after that beautiful meeting uh, one, one year ago in Bhopal. Uh, so um, my talk will be concerned with uh, those two uh, very important guys in quantum mechanics, which are Schrodinger and Dirac Hamiltonians. And in particular, I will be uh, speaking about uh, some uh, recent results and open problems concerning with spectral theory for those uh, operators, uh, with particular attention to some class of uh, uh, critical perturbation, critical lower order perturbation. So it will be uh, always concerned with a linear operator. There is no nonlinear theory. And I will try always to sketch some uh, uh, insight about the connect the strong connection which is uh, uh, between uh, um, which is in some problems concerning uh, spectral theory with uh, PDEs. Okay, so uh, let me scroll down. Okay, so this is the very first uh, operator, the, so the well-known Schrödinger operator minus delta plus v. The free Schrödinger operator is minus delta in R D acting on. Uh, L2 of Rd on the Hilbert space L2 of Rd. And V is what I call the perturbation. V is typically um, a function which all around this seminar could be uh, possibly complex valued. And uh, from the point of view of quantum mechanics, we represent the interaction of a free particle with an external uh, electric, uh, electric field where V is the potential. So the, the field is the, the gradient of the potential. And this is the usual way in quantum mechanics to describe, to describe uh, a non-relativistic particle. Um, this is uh, what Schrodinger introduced in 1929, and maybe the main reason for which he got in, at the same year with uh, uh, Paul Dirac, the Nobel Prize for physics. Uh, while the Dirac Hamiltonian is something a bit more complex to write, but uh, uh, also quite natural. It's a first order operator for the principal part, which is uh, uh, this guy here. Uh, uh, Luca, the... just uh, yes? one minute. <clears throat> Are you scrolling down to the next page? I, I scrolled, yes. But uh, we cannot see. Uh, yeah. You cannot see it. Okay, so yeah, you have... Yeah. So it seems that something is happening. And then what he needed to, uh, what was to somehow factorize the Laplacian into some differential square root. So the, 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 the square root of the Laplacian, which is the, the first thing you, you do, is not consistent with general relativity because it's pseudo differential and in particular it is a non-local operator. While Dirac needed uh, some local operator, some differential operator, because in, in order not to violate the so-called causality principle in general relativity, he needed some operator which preserves the supports of a function. So if you, have, if you have a function with compact support, then the operator should preserve this uh, property. And he was able to do it, uh, paying the price that, uh, of course, you passed from an equation to a system. Uh, this is the, the brilliant idea by Dirac. Uh, so this is the Hamiltonian. Um, the term M beta has to be interpreted as, as a mass term in the operator, while V again is the interaction with an external particle. Uh, possibly V here can be even a matrix, a uh, four by four matrix with entries in C. So the situation is analog. But uh, the first equation is of uh, order two, this one is of order one. So the scaling is different. So how to define these operators? This, is, uh, this goes back to the, uh, to the perturbation theory uh, stated uh, mainly by Cato in the 70s. Um, so for the, oper for the Schrodinger operator, uh, what you usually do when you apply perturbation theory is to define a quadratic form, which is this guy here on a suitable domain of functions, which is just the functions in L2 for which uh, this, guy, this guy here is finite. And then you look to it as a perturbation of a free uh, form, which is in this case, just this Dirichlet integral here. And you ask to this perturbation QV to be somehow small with respect to this guy here. This, this, this is um, oh, the, the philosophy of the perturbation theory by Cato. In this case, one possibility is to introduce 
to, uh, to, to ask to QV to satisfy this kind of inequality, this kind of uh, relative form boundedness inequality, which tells you that it has to be smaller than the free quadratic form here with a constant which is strictly less than one. If this happens, if this happens, which is uh, of course a condition on V on the perturbation here, then you can, uh, uh, sorry, then you can define properly um, a differential operator here uh, as an extension of uh, this quadratic form here on a suitable domain. I will not enter the details uh, for, the, for this seminar. But just to understand mathematically what we are saying, it, when, when, you, when, you, um, add, when, I mean, when you study an inequality, it's uh, important to understand when, uh, what's the functional scale defined by this inequality. I mean, which is the functional scale for this guy here, V, for which this inequality here is somehow critical. And the best way to do it is to, to work on the scaling and to notice that Q0, the Dirichlet integral, scales at this way when you scale the function uh, he is applying uh, he is applying to. So if you scale psi lambda as psi, uh, psi of lambda x, then Q0 of psi lambda is just lambda to the two minus d uh, Q0, where d is the dimension. And then we say that uh, v is scaling critical just when the perturb the, the, per the, the, I mean, the, the quadratic form, which is per the perturbed quadratic form QV scales exactly at the same way. In particular, uh, if V is an homogeneous function of some degree, then you immediately see that uh, the degree for which uh, this, this happens is exactly minus two. So if V is an homogeneous function of degree minus two on RD, then uh, the, the, the QV scales exactly at the same way as the Q0. If you want to think to some critical functional scale, you can, I mean, the, the simplest way to, to do it is to think to the, either to the L, LP space uh, LD half, but which is not, uh, I mean, this function one over X squared is not in this space. So you think to the, to the weak LD half space, but of course you can choose other scales. I'm, I'm sorry, other spaces, but not other scales. So the inverse square potential one to the x, one divided by x to the, to the one to divide, divided by x square, we will say that it is critical with respect to this inequality here. And the analog for Dirac, now if you do the same argument and if you look to the scaling, uh, is x to the minus one, okay? And this is just because of the, Dirac Hamiltonian is order one, while the Schrodinger one is of order two. And the notice that the free part of the Dirac Hamiltonian, what we called Q0 in the former case, is not uh, uh, the L2 norm of the gradient, but it lies as the scale of H dot one half, because here you have a Psi, Nabla Psi, okay? So the, there is a different scale. And the critical scaling here is the one given by the potential x to the minus one, which is the very well-known Coulomb potential, okay? Okay, so taking into account this, just some recall some notations. So um, this is the notations I will use. So if T is an operator on a Hilbert space, then sigma T will be the spectrum of T. So the set of Z in C for which T minus Z is not bijective which means not, uh, uh, in, I mean, not invertible with uh, continuous inverse. And I will, I will uh, always write the, the sigma p uh, for the point spectrum, the eigenvalues. So the z for which this guy here is not injective. Uh, the continuous spectrum sigma c is the set of uh, complex number z, which are not eigenvalues and for which uh, the rank of t minus z has closure, which coincides with the wall Hilbert space, and all the rest is a residual spectrum. And uh, the resolvent is just the inverse of T minus Z when Z is not in the spectrum. Okay, for the free Schrodinger and Dirac Hamiltonian, it is a, a classical and well-known fact and an exercise in uh, Fourier analysis that the spectrum of minus Laplace it's purely continuous, so there are no eigenvalues and no residual spectrum, and it coincides with the positive real line, including the zero. 
while for Dirac, something analog happened, but taking into account that the Hamiltonian is not positively uh, defined, then you have the union of two lines, the first one from minus infinity to minus m, and the second one from m to infinity, okay? And it's always uh, purely continuous. In both cases, there are no eigenvalues. So the fact that there are no eigenvalues, you always have to think that uh, there, there are no, solu no L2 solutions of, uh, of some suitable PDE. While for the fact that the spectrum is purely continuous and there is no residual spectrum, this is more um, a kind of universal fact coming from, uh, from functional analysis and in particular from the, the theory by, by Weil. Okay, so uh, let me go to uh, go back to the um, to the previous inequalities. Um, so this is QV, you remember, in the case of uh, Schrödinger, and we are asking for QV to satisfy an inequality like this. While for Dirac, you are asking um, um, morally to satisfy an inequality like this, where here you have half derivative of psi in L two. So notice that, and this is just by Hölder and some sharp Sobolev embedding, that if V in the first case for the little star, if V is sufficiently small in L weak LD half, then uh, little star holds. No? Because you just apply Hölder first, you get, uh, uh, you go uh, with Psi in some LP space, and then you, which is the one which embeds on H1. And, and uh, some analog fact happens with uh, Dirac, but here the critical case, critical uh, space, as I told before, is weak LD. Okay, so what we what we want to to try to try to do is to understand that those inequalities here has some smallness conditions on the potential. So maybe the main question of this seminar and on the, uh, what we are trying to do is to give a suitable notion of smallness for a perturbation. For Schrödinger, this is something. Uh, uh, this is a problem which is uh, really classical. So starting from the 60s, something in fact from from Cato and from the pioneer works by Barry Simon. Uh, this is maybe the very first question you ask. So in which sense you can ask to be to be small? So here we have a, um, a smallness which implies that uh, in particular the the form is subordinated, and you can. Uh, define a differential operator, as I said before. But our question is uh, more related to the spectral features of the, of the operators which are involved. And as we will see in the next slides, our question is, um, is there some suitable notion of smallness on, on V for which we can ensure that the spectrum of the complete Hamiltonian is exactly the same as the spectrum as the free Hamiltonian? Uh, uh, Luca, just one minute. Yes. This in the previous inequality, when you wrote a strictly less than one, so yes. that's crucial in keeping the spectrum uh, same. No, that, 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 we will see. We will see. So it, it will be crucial for the spectrum, but here it is already crucial at the level of the definition of the operator. So in order to define the operator by using some extension theory, the classical one is by Friedrichs, you have to ask to your quadratic form to be positive somehow or bounded from oh, below. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the condition sure. are strictly less than one is, is fundamental. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay? okay, yeah. So if, if A is bigger than one, you can define, you typically can define extensions of your operator but you will, not, you will not be in the case in which you are always, always working with only one extension, okay? Mm -hmm. So you are passing from the world of uh, uh, essential self-adjointness to, to the world of self-adjointness, okay? And typically you have an infinite uh, uh, class of uh, yeah, extension yeah. of your quadratic form and you have to choose, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, thank you. So, but our question will be related now to the spectrum and uh, I think I'm quite ready to do it. Let me just uh, go for a while on Dirac again, because uh, uh, there is something important to note is that uh, uh, for the critical potential for Dirac, which is the Coulomb potential, it is well known. And this is in fact what Dirac uh, it's himself did uh, in his book uh, in 1929, in his uh, paper in 1929. Um, no matter the size of this perturbation you, you have, so no matter the, the size of, of this gamma, number gamma here is, 
you always uh, create uh, eigenvalues, a uh, set of eigenvalues uh, inside the spectral gap. Okay, so between minus M and M, you always see eigenvalues. And this is why Dirac uh, got so famous because uh, those uh, are understood from the point of view of quantum mechanics as the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. And uh, those numbers here, yeah, he was able to compute explicitly those numbers here by just using the, uh, the algebraic uh, properties of the matrices. And uh, they fitted very, very good with the experiments, okay? So he computed these eigenvalues here. And in particular, he proved that uh, uh, they fit with the experiments. Uh, at the same time, six months later, another famous guy, Walter Gordon, the one of the Klein-Gordon equation, also computed the solution, the explicit solutions. So it turns out that this model here is uh, completely solvable, okay? Uh, so, but this is an important remark because for Dirac, it happened something uh, very peculiar that uh, the critical perturbations, which is one of the regs for the case of Dirac, no matter the, the size of this number here is, they always produce eigenvalues inside the, the spectral gap. While this, as we will see in a while, will not happen for Schrodinger in presence of the critical perturbations, okay? And we will try to understand it from the point of view of a harmonic analysis. So the, the very first question is um, somehow related to what uh, you um, were asking to me before. So it's uh, for Schrodinger, let's say. Let me go back to uh, inequality little star. Inequality little star, so it's for a, for a strictly less than one, the one which permits you to define the Schrodinger operator with V as a, 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 a suitable extension of the quadratic form. And the very first question is uh, uh, about eigenvalues, let's say. So does, uh, uh, the subordination condition little star imply absence of eigenvalues, both discrete and embedded eigenvalues in the continuous spectrum for minus delta plus V? This is a very natural question to ask. And so uh, some, um, uh, some partial answers to this question, uh, to, to get some partial answers to this question, we have to go back to the seminal paper by Barry Simon in 1971, in which he proved that is, if V is small in this uh, uh, so-called Rolnik class, uh, which is this guy here. This is the definition in R3 of the Rolnik class. Uh, suitably small, this is the number where Simon um, uh, finds, a four pi to, to the square. Then you don't have eigenvalues for the complete Hamiltonians, okay? But you have to notice that this class is almost scaling critical. It is not scaling critical because in particular, if you take SV, the inverse square potential, one over X square, which we know by scaling is the, the scaling critical guy. So this, this does not belong to this class. Okay, it's too singular, this guy, to be finite in that case. So uh, 40 years later, Rupert Frank in 2011, proved that, proved something a bit stronger, which is that you can uh, replace this, uh, non-local Rolnik class here, which L3 half. L3 half again is um, almost critical in the sense that uh, it's uh, as close as you want to the critical scale of uh, one of the inverse square potential in dimension three, but it is not critical. Again, one over X squared does not belong to this class, okay? But Frank proved that if V is small in L3 half and with an explicit number here, then there are no eigenvalues again. And both results can be generalized to any dimension, at least uh, bigger or equal than three, okay? And uh, so to have a complete answer to this problem in dimension three, uh, there is this paper I wrote uh, together with Krai, and Vega in 2018, in which we proved that in dimension three, and uh, the question is completely open in dimension D larger than three, if you, um, if you have just the subordination inequality little star, speaking about before, which is this one with A strictly less than one, then the spectrum of the complete Hamiltonian is purely continuous and it coincides with the positive real lines. So nothing happens to the, um, to the, to the free spectrum, okay? And you see that this is a, a, an essential difference with uh, the world of Dirac. No, in which, uh, in the case of the scaling critical perturbation, Coulomb, you always produce eigenvalue. 
So this is telling you that this, this inequality here is somehow a good notion of small, small perturbation for Schrodinger. Uh, if you if you interpret it as uh, uh, it, it does not create anything in the spectrum, so for the spectral picture is completely uh, invariant under this kind of perturbations here. Okay, and again the question is completely open in uh, other dimensions. I, I I will try to to explain why. Uh, so this is just a sketch of the proof of this fact. So we want to prove that the, the spectrum is purely continuous and it coincides with the, the positive real lines. So we have to prove uh, uh, different some, some things. We have to prove that uh, there is no residual spectrum and we have to prove that there are no eigenvalues and that the continuous spectrum is uh, coincides with the positive real lines. So the fact that the residual spectrum is absent is some kind of a universal fact uh, uh, from, from algebra, okay? Uh, it always happens, uh, it, it's always this way for, for, for a, a large class of, uh, of Hamiltonians. Uh, the identity, uh, the, the fact that the continuous spectrum coincides with the positive real line essentially is the same proof as in the free case. Uh, for those of you who are aware of uh, which is the classical proof, you just have to introduce some vile sequence and the same sequences which are working for the free case work here thanks to this inequality here. Okay, so I will not enter the details. Here, the, really the difficult part, as always, is to prove that there are no eigenvalues. There are no eigenvalues wherever. And to prove this, the argument we use is based on uh, the so-called birman schwinger principle which is the fact that uh, if you define this operator here as an operator, as a one parameter complex family of operators, KZ, where Z is a, is a complex number, which is a kind of sandwich between uh, the, the square roots of the potential and the free resolvent, then it's very simple to see at least at a formal level, then you have to justify it, but you, you can always justify it, then you can believe that uh, uh, it is equivalent that Z is an eigenvalue of your Hamiltonian to the fact that minus one is an eigenvalue of KZ, okay? It's completely equivalent. And you, formally it's uh, uh, almost obvious. You just have to write things and uh, to use the, uh, to conjugate this uh, V to the one half to the other side, okay? And to use the equation for the eigenvalues. So once you have this, uh, you immediately realize that um, to, if you want uh, to avoid eigenvalues, uh, or let me say it, it in another way, if you want an eigenvalue, sorry, if you want an eigenvalue for HB, then you need to find an eigenfunction of KZ with eigenvalue minus one. So if in particular, I can tell you that KZ as an operator on L2 is bounded with a uniform bound in Z, which is strictly less than one, then this cannot happen, of course, no? And so everything, uh, matters in this way are reduced to study the boundedness properties of this operator here, KZ, as an operator in L2. And if you want to disprove the absence of, of eigenvalues, uh, if you want to disprove the presence of eigenvalues for your uh, Hamiltonian, then, it will be sufficient for you to prove that this operator as an operator in L2 is bounded with bound less than, which is essentially what I wrote down here. So this is the consequence. If the, if the operator KZ has a uniform bound, uniform with respect to Z on the Hilbert space you are working with bound strictly less than one, then there are no eigenvalues for your Hamiltonian. This is a very strong principle, very well known in quantum mechanics, but the link with harmonic analysis is that uh, then, uh, as you can realize, if you look to the, to the definition of KZ, now if you, if you want to, to find the uniform L2 estimate for this guy here, you have to look for uniform LP, LQ estimates for the, for the resolvent H0, okay? Which is something uh, uh, which people in harmonic analysis are very familiar with starting by the uh, pioneer papers in the 80s by Carlos Koenig together with Jerison first, and then together with uh, Ruiz and Soge. Okay, so this is KZ, okay. 
and again you want to prove that it is uh, uh, it is uh, uniformly bounded on L2 on the Hilbert space and the very first guy doing this kind of uh, argument to disprove uh, eigenvalues for your Hamiltonian is Rupert Frank in 2011 he gave a kind of breakthrough in the theory because uh, everything is, is much simpler. So he somehow put everything together, put uh, all um, many things which were well known together from several different communities. And now the picture is quite uh, more clear. So in 3D in particular, where uh, in, the, in the paper with Kraichirik and Vega we work, uh, the free resolvent has an explicit representation, which is this one. It is essentially uh, the green function is uh, one over x, okay? And then there is uh, um, a numerator here, which in 3D has this very clear formula, which is this, this complex exponential. And this, this all only happens in 3D, you know, uh, because in, in general, the, um, the representation of the green function here has a power here, which is x to the uh, d half minus one in any dimension, but here at the numerator you have oscillation. You have um, oscillation in terms of Hankel functions, okay? So, but in 3D, there is this miracle which occurs that uh, you can uh, estimate everything with uh, energy zero equals, uh, z, z equal to zero, okay? So in particular, you have a point y, a point estimate, point wise estimate, very strong of the resolvent uh, which, uh, which tells you that the resolvent at Z on F is pointwise bounded by the resolvent at zero on F, okay? And so this is, a, this is the, the miracle of 3D. This does not happen in any other dimension, okay? Once you have this, it's very simple to close the argument for the estimate because this is now the, um, the little star condition, okay? So the little star condition, you, you, you can write it this way. Okay, if you remember it. And it implies that you can estimate the Birman-Schwinger operator Kz this way here, just uh, um, pointwise bounding this guy here uniformly in Z with the frequency zero, and then to split the minus one in minus one half plus minus one half. And then you use this condition here for this and the dual of a little star for this other guy to end up with F in L2, okay? So in particular, if A is strictly less than one, you have that Kz is bounded in L2 with bound strictly less than one. And this implies that you don't have any eigenvalues. Uh, okay, uh, what happens here? Okay, let, let, let's check it uh, from another point of view. So again, the, um, the exercise is to try to bound Kz of Psi in L2, okay? We want to end up to in L2. So this is Kz. We don't have now. We don't have that that strong condition uh, we are using in R3. In R3, what can we do? So first of all, you have v to the one half. So assume that v is in the critical scale. Forget about uh, the weak LD half. Now, for a while, think to LD half. Okay. So if v is then is, is in LD half, so in particular, v to the one half is in LD. Uh, you use, uh, um, I mean, you, you make a uh, helder here, you end up with the resolvent in this 2D divided by D minus two, okay. Uh, the resolvent in 2D divided by D minus two, essentially, since the resolvent is the, the convolution with uh, one over X to the D half minus one, you can bound it uh, uh, from this space to this other space to divide it by D by divided by D plus two. And again, you use a uh, helder to put uh, V to the half here and to end up in L2, okay? So this argument together with this estimate for the resolvent, this uniform in Z estimate for the resolvent gives you that uh, if V is small in this space, again, you have uh, that the Birman finger operator is small in L2 and so you don't have any eigenvalues. So the scale, the critical scale, the critical estimate, which is defined by the scale of the Schrodinger operator is this one here. And this is one example of the family of so-called uniform resolvent estimates by Koenig, Ruiz and Sogge. Okay. This holds, this holds to through in any dimension D larger or equal to three, of course. 
uh, okay, you can do the same argument for the weak LD half space. I will not enter the details, uh, just use uh, generalized uh, Helder inequalities and sub 11 embeddings. Okay, uh, so let me uh, speak a bit about uh, resolvent estimates. Uh, so uh, you are looking for a bound for this operator, minus delta minus z to minus one. In particular, what we are looking for are a priori estimates for L2 solutions to this equation here, okay? This equation is very well known in Fourier analysis. This is, the Fourier formulation is this one, okay? And so in particular, um, this a very interesting model in Fourier analysis when this uh, numerate, this Fourier multiply here can be singular, which is the case in which Z is an, a positive number, okay? If Z is a positive number, which I called K square, then this is the so-called Helmholtz equation. Okay, uh, so Kenny Gruis and Sov in 1987 for this equation, were able to prove that uh, uh, all a uh, general family of estimates hold true. And those estimates have a precise dependence on the parameter Z, which is given by this factor here. But you always have to think that what you are doing is essentially stationary phase, fixing the parameter Z being equal, let's say, to one. And then this, this number here just came, comes from, from the scaling, okay? And those are the conditions here. And there are later extensions to this problem and blah, blah, blah. So in this family, there is one example, which is the example in which D over P equals the D plus two divided by two, which is the former one. Okay, which is the case in which this estimate is completely uniform with respect to Z. Okay, now if you use this, uh, this family of estimates, okay, uh, and you use them to bound the Birman Winger operator, then you can end up with an estimate like this. So assume that now F is an eigenvalue, uh, I'm sorry, F, uh, assume now that you have eigenvalues, so that lambda is an eigenvalue from your, for your Hamiltonian, and in particular, minus one is an eigenvalue for Riemann's Ringer, and pick up an eigenfunction for, uh, for the eigenvalues minus one. Do the same computation as before. Use the kenny gruis and Soge estimate, which gives you uh, this kind of decay with respect to the parameter lambda. Uh, of course, here there is a misprint. This z here is lambda, okay? And you end up with an estimate, which is this one, okay? Which tells you that uh, if you have an eigenvalue, then it has to be bounded by this guy here. So this is an, a kind of estimate which people in mathematical physics usually like a lot because it's a typical localization estimate for the eigenvalues of your Hamiltonians, okay? And again, this kind of estimate comes from uh, an, an, an estimate, a uniform estimate for the free resolvement, okay? Which is an harmonic analytical, harmonic analytical problem. Uh, so in that paper in, of 2011, Frank was able to prove this uh, kind of results. And in particular, it got, it got quite famous at that time because uh, um, in dimension, uh, it, it, it solved at least in dimension one and two, an open conjecture by uh, Laptev and uh, Safronov, okay? As far as I know, the conjecture is still open in dimension larger or equal to three, at least for non-radial potentials. Okay. Uh, so LPLQ estimate for the resolvent, as um, most of you know, are usually, um, maybe I shouldn't say difficult to prove, but at least uh, uh, hard to, to prove that they are true. Usually they just uh, they are just um, false. Uh, for example, when you add uh, first order perturbations to your operator. So in in harmonic analysis, there is another setting of estimates, uh, more or less at the same scale, but using different spaces, uh, which is uh, um, the setting of weighted L2 estimates. So now let me uh, exit for a while the setting of uh, and PLQ estimates, a la Kenning rings and so okay, and speak for, for a bit about weighted L2. So again, my um, uh, guy will be the Birman Winger operator. So let's take one example of uh, one very famous example of uh, a weighted L2 estimate, at least for people working in PDEs, which is the so-called Kato Yajima estimate, which is this one. So it's telling you that 
the resolvent the free resolvent operator uh, um, acting on S is bounded on L2 with weight X to the minus one. Okay, here with uh, F in L2 with weight X. And this bound here is uniform with respect to Z. It's a very famous estimate proved by Kato and Yajima. And from the point of view of functional analysis, this is completely equivalent to the so-called Hardy inequality for the, for the Laplacian. So now if you use this to bound the Birman-Winger operator here, then you end up, um, I'm sorry. No, this is the proof of this, I'm sorry. So now if you use this inequality here to bound the Birman-Winger operator, which is what I'm doing here, then you end up that with the fact that if V to the one half x in L infinity is small, which means that if V is pointwise bounded by the inverse square potential, then again, you have that the Birman Winger operator is bounded in L2 with a bound which can be strictly less than one, okay? So this condition here again appears naturally uh, when you work at this scale of functional, functional inequality. So somehow the a uniform LP LQ estimate, which we used before, is at the same scale of uh, this estimate here by Kato and Yajima. Of course, the result here is a bit weaker because you end up with a pointwise condition on V, while in the other case, you ended up with the condition V in LD half, okay? But the, the, the scale is, uh, is, uh, is safe. You cannot kill the scale. Okay. Uh, for a different approach to, for, for the absence of eigenvalues, if you want to avoid Birman Schwinger, you can try to prove directly on the complete equation involving V that uh, um, this guy here, this is, the, this is the solution of your resolvent equation, okay, uh, has a bound like this. Yeah, you, you see, this is a, a so-called uniform Sobolev estimate, which you are uh, estimating in L2 a gradient, uh, not of your solution, but of a suitable gauge transformation of your solution with the same uh, space XF in L2. So in particular, it, Im it immediately implies that uh, you cannot have eigenvalues. Uh, this is much more related to the PDE structure of the, of the Helmholtz equation. And uh, in the last year, we were able to, um, to somehow sketch a kind of a, um, clean theory about how to prove this kind of estimates for more general operators just by PDE techniques, okay? Let's say integrating by parts. But today I will not enter the details of this. Okay, so my main question is now, what about Dirac? Okay, so as I hoped, I was able to, uh, to convince you at the beginning, uh, there is a main difference between Schrodinger and Dirac. So for Schrodinger, there is a natural notion of small perturbation, which is give, given by the scaling itself. So if V is scaling critical, it's the inverse square, and if it is sufficiently small in size, then you know that uh, uh, you cannot create anything. Okay, while for Dirac, the scaling critical potential, which is Coulomb, you already know since the beginning that no matter the size it is, you always create something in the spectrum. Okay, so the notion of small perturbation for Dirac, for Dirac is completely, is much more difficult and more, mostly completely unclear, at least from my point of view at the moment. Okay, so in fact, I, I will end up with some, some open questions about it. So let's try to do the same exercise as before for Dirac and to take V in the scaling critical space, uh, I mean, let's, let's say LD, okay? You can, you, you can tell me, okay, you should take weak LD. But let's take LD because for the numerology it's the same. So you bound the birman winger operator in LD. So now you have V2 one half, you have to put it in LD, okay? Which means, uh, uh, I mean, if V is in LD, V to the one half in L2D, okay? Uh, you do the same argument as, as before, and you realize that if you want to close the circle here and to end up with psi in L2, then you need this estimate, okay? And this estimate, which should be more or less the analog as the former one, um, for some reason is false, okay? There are several ways to see that it is false. There is at least one way in harmonic analysis to see that it is false, because uh, if this were true, 
then you should be able to prove that uh, um, you, to prove some uniform LPLQ estimate for the gradient of the free resolvent for Schrodinger, which you know they are false because you if, if they were true, you would uh, disprove uh, the, um, the the range the the sharp range from below of the Thomas Stein theorem. Okay. But maybe the, at least for the aim of this seminar, the simplest way to see that this estimate it is, is false is to observe that if it were true, then you could use it to close the circle here. And in particular, to prove that if V is small in the critical space, then you don't have eigenvalues. Well, you know, because uh, Dirac itself told you that you always have eigenvalues, okay? So this is a more mathematical, physical approach to the, um, to, to the counter examples to, to this inequality. So this inequality here is false. This is the main difference with the former case. Okay, so you cannot, you cannot close the argument here. Okay, and so you have to try to do something different. Okay, the first thing one has to do, so here again is to look to the fundamental solution of your problem. Let's think in dimension three again. So if you use the fact that the square of the Dirac operator is the Schrodinger operator, with a mass m square, then by simple uh, um, algebraic identities, you can represent the resolvent of the Dirac operator using uh, the fundamental solution of the Schrodinger of the Schrodinger operator. Okay, and you end up that uh, with the fact that the green function for the Dirac resolvent is this guy here, and again you see the same oscillations as the Schrodinger equation, a Schrodinger operator here, of course with a parameter which depends also on the mass here. Uh, the scaling here uh, is different because uh, you, you have to understand that somehow at some point you have to differentiate the Schrodinger Green function. And uh, once the, 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 deri the derivative goes to the uh, no denominator, which in the former case was x squared, and this gives you a x cube factor, which is here. But once you have to differentiate the phase here, when you differentiate the, fa the phase, you get the x square, which is here and here, but you get a term here and another term here, which grow with z. So this is the, 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 the main point. There is a growth in z in, uh, in these green functions, which uh, was not present in the case of Schrodinger, okay? Uh, and you can always think to those guys here has fractional integrals. So the, there is a fractional integral of order uh, one and another one of order two. Uh, one of them is related to the scaling of Schrodinger. So it scales like uh, weak LD half. And the other of them, it's relating to this scaling here, which is the typical scaling for Dirac, okay? So it seems when you look to the green function that here the scaling should be a mix of LD, LD if LD intersects LD half, okay? But here it is, it's also clear that there is a huge difference between the case M equals zero and M different from zero, as we will see in the sequel. Okay, so one possibility is to, exact, to, to do exactly what, uh, what I told you. Uh, of course, you, um, I mean, you lose the, uh, with this argument the possibility to um, handle this growth in Z. And you accept that you will not be able to prove uh, uniform estimates. But uh, if, Z, if you allow Z to live in a compact set of the complex space, then you can do the same argument as before. And to prove that if V is in LD half uh, plus LD, then a spectrum of HV cannot be inside a compact set of the uh, complex plane, which uh, size depends on the size of V, okay? This is essentially what in the last year uh, we have been doing together with uh, a French guy, Jean-Claude Canen and uh, David Krejcilic, okay? So uh, in 1D, the particular shape of the green functions I will not speak about, permit to work with potential which are purely inner one. Okay, this is a paper by Kenan, Laptev, and Tretter in 2014. So, but my question, uh, my original question is still, uh, is still open. So, um, um, is it possible to prove some uniform in Z resolvent estimate for this guy? Uh, so, for those of you who, um, who uh, are familiar with uh, Kenny Gris and Soge estimates, 
uh, you understand that uh, here there is no possibility to get LPLQ, but so what, what about weighted L2, okay? So for weighted L2, uh, this is more or less the argument of the last part of my talk. Do I have the 10 minutes more, no? I think yes. Uh, yes, you have. Okay, thank you. So for the last part of this talk, I would like to enter the magic word of uh, weighted L2 estimate, estimates related to this guy, which I will uh, uh, refer to the uh, agmon hermander theory for, uh, for Schrodinger, in fact, and then I will transfer them to, to Dirac, okay? Okay, so how to use the oscillations? So first of all, let's do maybe for the last time the exercise to see which kind of estimates I would like to prove. So I would like again to, to prove that KZ F is bounded by F in L2. And so again, uh, now we are, we are thinking to weighted L2. So uh, think to a pointwise condition on V, which tells you that V is pointwise bounded, pointwisely bounded by the critical guy, which is Coulomb in this case. You close the circle here, and you see that the weighted estimate here, which you need, which, which um, played the role of Kato Yajima before, is this one. You, know, you, you see that the homogeneity here is changed. Before you had x here and x to the minus one. Here, as you can expect, you have x to the one half, x to the minus one half. This is unweighted L2 estimate. And unfortunately, again, this is, a, this is false, okay? But this is false for a deeper reason. Uh, maybe, because this is false. Uh, and to see that this is false, you have to interpret it as an endpoint estimate uh, among the family of hagmon hermander estimate. Maybe, okay, this is this is the line. And so um, just to end up with hagmon hermander let me, let me go back to, to the Schrodinger world and to say what I mean by this. So again, the model is uh, maybe the, one of the most important models in harmonic analysis in PDEs for harmonic analysis, which is the Helmholtz equation, which is this one. Again, the solution in Fourier is represented this way. So the uniqueness of solution for this equation for when F is in L2 is quite clear. Okay, this is the fact that the Fourier transform is an isometry. And this guy here, K square minus uh, Xi square, which is the denominator of the symbol, vanishes on a null set for the Lebesgue measure, okay? So for the existence of solution, you have to work more. Uh, and you need to assume that uh, F hat vanishes on the singular set, on the sphere, in a suitable sense. In, in this case, uh, it's the L2 trace sense. And you also need to assume that the restriction map, which uh, um, associates to a radius R, the uh, restriction of the Fourier transform of F on the sphere of radius R as a function of the angulus uh, is regular enough, okay? In particular, you can prove, this is Agmon work, you can prove that uh, uh, if, if it is uh, alpha holder continuous with alpha strictly being greater than one half, it is sufficient to prove that uh, uh, you have a solution. So this is, this is essentially the, the, the work by Agmon in the uh, early 70s. So in particular, under these conditions here, then uh, you have a unique solution of this problem, okay? And Agmon proved the following. Agmon proved in that if F is in this weighted L2 space, which is strictly bigger than one half, please notice that this is a strict condition here. And the number one half here coincides with the end point of the former slide, which I told you it's false. And you also assume that the Fourier transform on F vanishes on the sphere of radius K in the L2 trace sense, then there exists a unique solution U, which is in, in the space L2 with weight one with weight one plus X, so at infinity X to the S minus one, okay? So notice that the case S equal one half is exactly the end point here, okay? And to see that uh, uh, the end point here, S equal one half is false, you just have to look to the fundamental solution of the Helmholtz equation, okay? So, so the, the those one who, which uh, um, uh, satisfy the so-called Sommerfeld radiation condition at the infinity. 
So the main ingredient now uh, is this one, okay? So how to prove uh, uh, weighted L2 estimates? Just, I mean, there is an, uh, by Fourier analysis, you just write the solution. You want to estimate this guy here and you just apply stationary phase. It's nothing uh, mysterious. You just apply stationary phase. If you can fix the parameter Z and then argue by scaling. And you prove that uh, if S is strictly bigger than one half, then uh, um, the resolvent operator, which, the, the, which is the operator which maps F into U, maps the weighted space L2S into the weighted space L2 minus S. And this estimate at the level of L2 has also a decay in Z, which tells you that the larger is Z, the better it is. And of course, it blows up at Z equals zero, as it has to be. While for the gradient, no, if you if you look to the gradient of the solution, then you have just to look to the gradient of the green function, okay? And then you see that for the gradient, when you differentiate here the exponential, you get a growth in Z, which is uh, exactly uh, the, the, the guy here, which kills this decay here. And then the analog estimate for the, the gradient you get is this one, but you don't have the decay in Z, okay? Okay, so this is what I, uh, like to call the hagman hermander estimate for the Schrodinger resolvent. Mm, this is the L2 estimate and this is the estimate for the gradient. So nowadays we also, we are also able to prove these estimates just by integration by parts, okay? So what about Dirac? For Dirac, then uh, you can understand that if you use the relation between Dirac and Schrodinger operator, Essentially, since you have to square the Dirac operator, at some point you have to under the gradient, as I told you before for the green function. So for Dirac, what you can expect is that you can prove estimates like this, the estimate for the gradient of Schrodinger, okay? Which is uniform in Z. But the, I mean, again, I think, I hope I convinced you, they are false when Z S equals one half, which is the estimate which lies at the critical scale, okay? And in fact, you can, uh, uh, you can work in some uh, kind of a refined space uh, of more recampanato times and to, and to work uh, with uh, weights which in harmonic analysis are usually called the Mitsuhata Takeuchi weights. And you can prove this kind of estimates here. The, the typical example you, have, you need to have in mind is something like X uh, to the power of one plus some logarithmic correction, okay? So in the case of one half, you don't reach exactly x to the power of one half, but you have some logarithmic uh, correction to add in order to get some integrability. Okay, so for Dirac, it is possible to get a uniform resolvent estimate, uniform with respect to Z, and to apply them to get absence of eigenvalues. And this was a difficult, a difficult kind of uh, uh, problem for people in mathematical physics. So we were able to do it, and now I will finally uh, uh, tell you what are our main last results. So those are the notations uh, for Dirac. This is the estimate, the resolvent estimate you can prove for Dirac. Okay, this is something I proved with Piero d'Ancona, in fact, in 2006. And uh, we rediscovered just one year ago for these uh, spectral problems. Uh, this is again the uh, the way you close the circle for the Birman Winger operator. Okay. Um, and in particular, you can, okay, so let me just tell you that uh, um, in the massless case, we can prove a resolvent estimates in which the weight here is uh, this guy here, W sigma I introduced before, this guy here. While for the massive case, and this is related to the shape of the green function, you cannot use this weight, but you have to, un to introduce a weight with the different behavior at zero at, at infinity at the, in the same style as in the case LD, LD half, okay? And this I'm calling uh, uh, tau epsilon, is this guy here, okay? So using these estimates, uh, we are able now to prove that, uh, for example, in the massive case, if V is small with respect to this weight, then there are no eigenvalues, okay? Okay, but uh, so what are the open questions? The open questions, the, the, very, the first natural question is, the, is this one. 
This is in fact a conjecture. So now assume that uh, there is no mass, okay? So if there is no mass in Dirac, there is no spectral gap. So either if you add Coulomb, you don't have space to create any eigenvalues. So in fact, for Dirac with Coulomb, uh, when the mass is zero, there are no eigenvalues. So the natural question is, is weak LD, a smallness in weak LD sufficient to imply that there are no eigenvalues in the complete Hamiltonians when there is no mass? The second natural question is, uh, in the case in which the mass is present, is this uh, asymmetric condition here sufficient to imply that uh, there are no eigenvalues wherever for the complete Hamiltonian? And to get some uh, partial answer to this, we just uh, uh, published a paper on uh, mathematician Nalem with together with our PhD student, Nico Schiavone, in which we proved that uh, you can go a bit further the weighted L2 class uh, entering the Hermander theory. So instead of working on weighted L2, you can work on those kind of uh, Banach spaces in which uh, you can you take uh, L1 uh, in um, L1 in one variable and L2 in all the other variables. And then you prove essentially by the same techniques, but first you have to prove some resolvent estimates that if V is small in some spaces like this, then you don't have eigenvalues. So the, the important fact is that uh, uh, this guy, this Banach space here is embedded in the Lorentz space LD1, which is embedded in LD. So it is a way to get a bit closer to a positive answer to that, this first uh, question here, but we are still far away to be, L, to be LD, okay? This is still not LD. Okay, uh, I think this is uh, more or less all what I wanted to tell you. It's been really, uh, really a pleasure for me to, to be here with you. And I hope, I wish you the best. So take care about you and your loved ones. And I think that hopefully not so late but quite soon we will be able to meet physically again somewhere. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Luca, for a, a wonderful talk. So are there any questions? Uh,